Hey everyone, welcome to California Haunts Radio. Tonight we've got a great guest, Catherine Ramsland, who has been on several TV shows, worked with a lot of big time cases, and has written a book with the BTK Killer. She's going to be joining us in a few minutes, so hang in there and away we go. Grab your popcorn and snacks. 
Find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, with a small dash of pixie dust, turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Well, hello everybody, good afternoon, excuse me, welcome to California Haunts Radio. My name is Charlotte. I'll be your host for the next hour. We've got a great guest for you tonight. It's something near and dear to my heart. Um, Like I've probably told you guys before, but I'll just remind the new listeners. I uh, spent seven years as a crime beat reporter in Yolo County. And it's something I will never forget because I met all kinds of characters and not only legal, illegal people, but... I've seen a lot of things in my time, and I've experienced a lot of things, and I've seen a lot of gross things on the beat, you know, things that a lot of people would rather forget. But, you know, that, but it just doesn't go to that. It goes back to growing up here in Sacramento in that my father um, wanted to be a, kind of wanted to be a police officer, but he didn't because of the danger of it, even though he had to think for law enforcement. So he would get us up or get me up. <laughs> If something happened in the neighborhood, you know, he would get me up and we'd go driving over to see what it was. So that was my background as a kid. You know, he'd bundle me up and off, off we go if he heard sirens and stuff. But the kid, but the, you know, the, the neat thing about it for me as a kid, it's an eye opener. Plus the fact that uh, Richard Trenton Chase lived like six blocks from me. If you guys don't know who Richard Trenton Chase was, he was one of these, like Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, where he would drink animal blood and all this other stuff. And and he had a reputation for capturing the neighbor's dogs and he'd hang them up in his front yard. And so, of course, after he got arrested, my father, you know, had to had to take us over there to, to show us where, where the house was. Just like Dorothea Puente, you know, the, uh, the rooming house, the old rooming house lady that lived in the Victorian downtown when she was taking the checks and... and and murdering, you know, drugging these these poor people that, that lived in her house. Of course, my dad had to take me down there, and we sat out in front while the police were investigating, that kind of thing, you know. And it just turned out that one of my best friends in high school, her father was the lead detect- one of the lead detectives on it. So it was kind of, that, that was really, you know, interesting for me as a, as a youngster, as a young person. So, of course, that led, one thing led to another, and I got used to doing that stuff. So when I got the opportunity to get, to get the job to be the crime beat reporter i was i jumped at it you know to do and uh yeah so i've had my share of interviewing people in jail i didn't run into any serial killers or anything like that I, you know murders yes serial killers no oh yeah and the other thing too when i was growing up quick add in east area rapist that was during the era of the east area rapist which most people know in the state of california as the i-5 killer because he wasn't only in Sacramento, he was down in like Orange County and stuff. And I remember growing up with him and the fear in this neighborhood. The fear. And I remember how, you know, people were getting crank phone calls all the time. And that, that, was, that was the age when people had like actual phones on their walls. And so the phone would ring, there'd be a crank phone call. And I remember everybody in this neighborhood always had a whistle. So if you got this crank phone call or a heavy breather or something, you'd, you'd blow in this whistle and, you know. But, I mean, the, 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 there was real fear here about the East Area Rapists. Real fear. So I grew up in all those eras. Right? And I know the people in Southern California grew up in a lot more eras, you know, with with um, a, a lot more uh, prolific killers down at that end. But uh, that's how I grew up. And so, like I said, when I got the chance to become a crime court reporter, I said, oh, yeah, I'll do it. It's something I'm interested in. And I'm still interested in it. You know, if I if, if I had it to do over and got off another job to, to be the beat reporter for a crime course, I would definitely do it because it's a very interesting beat to have. But my guest tonight, you've probably seen her on TV. You've probably seen one of her articles. You've probably heard about her. Catherine Razma, R- 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 sorry, R- Ramsland. Remember my lips again. It's the chocolate, you guys. I had another bunny. I had another, like, one of those sucker bunnies, you know, the tall ones. I had one of those. See, I'll show you. Here's my proof. Look at that. I nailed Peter Rapp today, okay? Just before the show. Anyway, so um, I'm excited to have her on. She actually worked with Dennis Rader to write his book. 
she got into this guy's mind. I mean, it's just craziness. So I'm really excited about it. So I'm going to bring her on. I'm not going to say anything else. Usually I have my, my you know, my, my, my usual spiel in the beginning. But I want to pick her brain. I, I want to talk to her. Because I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, what's it like to actually sit one-on-one? I mean, like I said, I've sat one-on-one with people that have killed people before. But nothing like Dennis Rader. Nothing, no one of that caliber. And when you go in and try to see, you know, figure out how these guys tick. Just like the gang members. I don't want to get in trouble. I'm not saying anything about gangs. Okay, because I don't want to come to my house. But it's a whole different world. When you start talking to people that are involved in gangs and stuff, they, they're wound differently than you are. In some ways, they're, they're wound like you are. In other ways, it's unimaginable how they're wound. And some are not, I hate to say it, you know, some are nice people. It's just they're involved in bad things. You know, they're involved in unfortunate things. But this is why I'm so glad to have this guest tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to shut up and let's bring Catherine in so we can talk to her. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I am so excited nice to have to be you here. I am so excited to have you on. Thank you. Tell them. Tell everybody about you because I've, I've seen you on TV. I've heard you on TV. I've seen you on TV. I've heard you on TV. Well, I'm a professor of forensic psychology and the author of 69 books, some of which are novels, but most of which are nonfiction. Uh, a lot of them are devoted to serial killers and extreme offenders, mass murderers, um, forensic psychology, forensic science. So I've had the the privilege to be able to work with a lot of really great people to turn what they do into books. And that's how I spend most of my time when I'm not in the classroom. Um, they're not well in the same. Serial killers are not well in the same as the rest of us, are they? I mean, there's just there's something going on in the brain that's just not sparking right. Complex question. <laughs> Um, psychopaths have a brain disconnect, but not all serial killers are psychopaths. Some are psychotic, some do regret what they've done, some are accomplices. So I wouldn't say, you know, across the board, all serial killers are have psychopathic brain disorders, but we do find in neuroscience that psychopathic brains are wired differently. Um, in terms of emotional depth and connection and uh, orientation to reward, lack of remorse, things like that. So if a serial killer is a psychopath, then I would say yes. Otherwise, not necessarily. What do you think? I mean, you know, you read about these people like Edmund Kemper, you know, Ted Bundy and stuff, and you look at their childhoods. Do you think that 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 that, that some of this stuff could be prevented because there's signs you know, in their childhoods that this is what's going to be, you know, possibly happening. Well, it's hard to talk about them in a big generic sense because we have 5,000 serial killers documented. It's not just a, the few dozen you see on true crime documentaries. There's, there's a lot of them. So I wouldn't be able to really just give you a generic sense of that. But certainly in some cases, there's child abuse or head injuries or um, neglect, humiliation, things like that, that that did affect the child and made them resentful or made them um, withdraw into fantasy. And it's a fantasy that empowered them. So you have to take, you know, I, I'm in psychology. I take them a case at a time and look at the developmental trajectory. With Raider, for example, he's an outlier. He doesn't have any of those issues. Maybe there's a little bit of, of head injury, but no abuse, um, no disjointed families. He had His parents were, were married. He had both sets of grandparents. He grew up as an all-American boy in, in Midwest Kansas. And the, you just didn't have that except for his very vivid fantasy life his narcissism, his desire to be famous, his need to dominate females because he felt humiliated and disempowered by them. And you put a lot of that together, someone like him could become a serial killer, but not necessarily. Sometimes the fantasy life satisfies what, whatever needs they have. 
you know, it's, it, it, and he's highly intelligent. I mean, he, he you know he got away with it for so long. What finally tripped him up, or what, what finally got him caught? <laughs> well, I mean, getting away with it is a, is part luck, part predatory calculation, part police mistakes. There's there's a combination of things. Uh, so we can't really attribute his success necessarily to being so clever that nobody could catch him. But um, what did finally trip him up actually was kind of dumb because he communicated with the police with, all, with what is he called his cat and mouse games. And he was sending them parts he, stories because he didn't, this is when after he had done the, the murders and he some time had gone by and then he found out that a, an attorney in town was going to be writing a, a retrospective of the BTK crimes that had not yet been solved. He didn't want somebody else to write his story. He wanted to write it, even though he ended up taking stuff from what we had on court TV about him. He used that, you know, those things. So that's kind of an irony. But then he would send this, he'd Xerox them and then copy them again and copy them again, send in that. But it was very time consuming. He knew how to use a computer. So he asked the detective, Ken Landwehr, the task force leader who, you know, who he thought they had kind of an interesting relationship with the cat and mouse game. And he said, well, if I send a floppy disk, would could you trace me? Because he had already asked a dig, you know, cyber cop if, the, if, if an email could be traced. Um, and the cyber cop gave him the wrong answer inadvertently. So he felt kind of safe. But he then used a disk that he had been using on his church computer. He just erased it. So that's a you know common idea that erasing is, is going to do it. He should have. Right. If he'd started with a brand new one in a computer, like at a library or something not related to him at his church. Um, anyway, he sent it in uh, and they got him. They were able to trace back to the church. Wow. Um, wow. Um, what's it like? I mean, I, like, like I said, I have talked to, to, to murderers in the past, you know, done interviews with them. It's usually, you know, when I talk to them, it's behind, it's behind the glass thing. And it's usually, well, you know, I didn't do it. I was, you know, this is what happened. What's it like talking to somebody like Dennis Rader? Is there a difference between talking to him and talking to somebody just, just, I'm not going to say normal murderer because I mean, you know what I mean? Somebody that does as many crimes as he did, as opposed to somebody that maybe kills somebody in a bar. Well, I mean, you're really asking about a personality, not really about what they did. So his personality, he's pretty narcissistic and he knows that. Uh, so it's very easy to talk to him and get him to talk about, you know, whatever, because he likes attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, that's different from somebody who perhaps has remorse about what they did, like uh, an accomplice, for example, or somebody who was in a couple and didn't realize what was going on and got tied into it somehow. So that's very different. He's different from somebody who doesn't want to talk about their crimes, even though they admitted to them, confessed to them, but don't really want to spend time talking about the details. Um, so, you know, it's, it's personality and Raider's personality is that he does like to talk about it, but he, he more liked to write about it. He wrote long detailed letters to me. And m most of the detail was in there because when you're talking on a prison phone, that's recorded. Mm -hmm. So we ended up talking in code quite a bit and uh, which was interesting in itself that he wanted to do this through code because it's kind of spy like and he, he liked to think of himself that way. Uh, but it was really the letters where he where most of that was brought out. And he wouldn't really even want to talk in detail on the phone or I did go to the prison, but the guards would hang out you know, listening to what we were talking about and in a you know maximum security you're it's not even through glass you are in two different rooms through a monitor so that that wasn't as effective as talking on the phone and that wasn't as effective as him just writing stuff and then me asking about it through this coded language that we came up with interesting that's really interesting to me and at this point he'd already been convicted or not at this point he'd already been convicted or not Oh, sure. Yeah. I didn't get involved with this project till um, 2010. And it had been started by somebody else 
after he was arrested in 2005, she had approached him and she wanted to do a book with him. Um, but after five years of writing letters back and forth, she just decided she didn't want to do it. And I saw her on Facebook and asked her whatever happened to her book because she had been in the news with it. Mm -hmm. And she asked me if I would take it over. So I had all the letters between them to use. And then I did five years of my own letters with him, correspondences and phone calls and all the things that we did. So I had about, I had a lot of material. I had about 10 years worth of material to do this book. That's incredible. I mean, to be, to get that close to, to, to somebody like him. I just find that, well, it, it's what you do for a living really, but I'm just saying it's just, it's just incredible to me too. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> I, I said, you know, I always had contact maybe an hour with somebody if I was lucky, you know, the, at the county jail. I can't imagine like you know, like having the, the amount of contact you had with him. Well, I mean, you have to, first they have to trust you. We played chess by mail for months before we even started. Uh, I find that with others. They have to, first of all, they have to know I'm going to stick around. I'm not, I'm not just in there like a journalist just getting my stuff and getting out and then bye-bye. Uh, I'm very interested in their lives. I still talk with Raider um, 11 years later. Uh, we're, we're, we still communicate. I just talked to him on Sunday. I, don't, I, I'm, I, I just take a different approach to the whole thing than people who, who just want something quick for an article or you know something like that. So the first thing is you have to get them to trust you. The second thing is you have to know their story really well, because if they're going to lie and manipulate and put on some spin doctoring, you have to know that you have to be willing to call them out. You have to keep boundaries. Like here's the times you're going to be able to call me um, and not otherwise, unless it's a, you know, some kind of emergency. Uh, so you have to, there, there are a number of things that you need to do to be able to communicate well with with uh, any of these people but once you do and once they trust you mm -hmm. you can get an a, incredible material that things that they hadn't thought about or hadn't thought that way about and they often appreciate being able to really explore uh, who they are what they've done with someone that has the, the kind of training i have because i used to be a therapist and now i'm a i'm a professor but i'm a i i've really delve deeply into many of their stories but you do have to know their story because you have to call them out when they you know when they try to present themselves in a different light than you know what they really would be now i did know with raider i also knew the da from the case and so i would she gave me her files and i knew some of the cops so that that actually helped a lot because their perspective on him uh, the perspective of the first woman who had started this, the perspective of some of his correspondence, that gives me a lot of different ways of looking at him and catching him. It, you know, if he wants me to think a certain thing of him versus what he wants the cops to think, now we've got two versions of a story. And then I can say to him, yeah, <laughs> not so sure about that. Let's Let's try that again. I just find that interesting because him being you know, a narcissist, they don't like to be told that they're that they're lying to you or they're not right. So that must have been something for him to have to swallow. And, and, and well, swallow. I don't say it quite like that. I, yeah, I, I don't just say, "Oh, you you narcissist, you are you liar." I wouldn't say that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I I would um, be firm and clear. No, I know I know what you said in this context. Um, let's think about that. And often he would then write a letter, two or three page letter, justifying why he said it to me the way he did. So that was always, I could count on that. I knew that if he was, did not like what I had said, um, he'd sort of withdraw, come up with, with a new way of saying it. And, and that was good for me because the more material, the better. Mm-hmm. I just find it interesting that, that he, well, I guess because you're a psychologist too, it probably felt good for him to get that off his chest. You know, the stuff that he didn't go over in court. You know what I mean? It, it was just like a relief for him, even sitting in jail, that, that he got it off his chest. 
I, I'm not sure that he really had any sense of that. I don't think he had remorse for what he had done. Um, they, they were his projects. He owned them. And and a lot of the, the sexually compelled serial killers are like that. Bundy felt that way about his, his victims. They belong to him now. Uh, Ridgeway, he didn't like when they were discovered because they belonged to him. So I think I think Dennis Rader had that kind of sense of it. Um, and I, I just I think that they what they do like is that I do have credentials, um, not just as, um, you know, with, with the professional credentials, but also as a writer and researcher that this is my area. So I know a lot of the stories of the other killers and I can make comparisons and I can bring in examples. Um, I, mean, I was talking to one who was an accomplice and, and I was able to tell him about other accomplices in comparison to his case. And that he found that very interesting. So it's not just the professional credentials, it's also the kind of research that I do and the writing that I've done. Well, I was thinking when you talked about, you know, him, you know, doing, doing stuff to challenge the police and all that, that made me think of the Night Stalker. You know, and, and what he did, yeah. the Zodiac's another one, you know, and what they did to to play that cat and mouse game, you know, with the cops. Is this a, is, is this a thing that, that they get off on? I mean, it's, it seems like the real big, big guys, except for, well, Bundy towards the end, of course, when he knew they were onto him and, you know, he would wash his car out in front of the cops and all this. But is this something that, that, that like I said, do they get off on this stuff? I mean, do they punch their ego that they're playing this game? Punch their ego that they're playing this game? It depends on who you're talking about, because some don't really care. They don't have any communication at all. Um, they just want to do what they're doing and hope they get away with it. Um, some like the cat and mouse game. Some are doing it with the media, not the cops, but some are directing it to the cops because they want to make sure those officers are linking their cases. For example, when, um, when they arrested three people for the Otero murders, which was Dennis Rader's first kills so he had he killed a family of four and they about eight months later they arrested three people that it, they thought were good suspects and he didn't like that uh not because not for reasons you think <laughs> he didn't like it because it was wasting his taxpayer dollars going in the wrong direction huh. and he also uh had murdered he'd also murdered Catherine Wright but he didn't really want that linked because her brother had survived. He had shot him, but he had survived and could identify him. So he needed to kill again in order to get that notoriety of being a serial killer, which he, of course, did do. But he did want the fame. He wanted to be considered an elite serial killer. He wanted his cases linked. So he wanted credit for it. Um, but at the same time, like Jack the Ripper, he wanted it to be unsolved. So he had this dilemma of, how do I get to be the serial killer that got away, but people know it's me? <laughs> wow. Because, you, th you know, you think about some of these criminals and their attitude is like, well, I kill one person. I might as well keep going because I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be in, you know, in jail for life anyway. And then you think about him really thinking this out. Well, they don't think they're getting caught. I mean, they're not thinking, Oh, I'm going to be in jail for life anyway. Cause they don't think they're going to get caught. He didn't. He didn't believe yeah. that he would get caught at all. I, I asked him once because he had used his son's car to distribute some of the cat and mouse cereal boxes with the Barbie dolls that he was using. And I said, what well, did it ever occur to you that if you were caught, what your son would think? He said, well, no, I wasn't ever going to get caught. And I think he really believed he would not get caught. So I don't think they're thinking about what are the consequences of this? I, I, I just think though, they just don't think like that. I just find this so interesting because I mean, I like I said, they don't think like us at all. I mean, it's just, it's just a complete cut off from what a normal person thinks. So. I mean, okay, so we do have thoughts sometimes of, you know, you get so angry sometimes, but we don't take it as far as, as they take it. We don't take it as far as they take it. Well, it's not all it's not all about anger. Only some of them are motivated by anger. Some are motivated by lust, by greed, by a sense of power and dominance over somebody, some by artistry. Some don't have any particular reason. So you can't really link, you know, their cases together because there's no ritual. There's no 
um, sense of why they did this and they just did. Uh, so it's, it's going to depend on the person, but they certainly see the world differently for the most part. Some do, but I think you can, you can say in general, because once they've killed and want to continue, because not all do, some are, have it in their fantasy life that they want to be serial killers. And then when they actually do it, they don't want to keep going because it's not like the fantasy, right? So those would be a different uh, category altogether. But the ones that do want to continue are going to be looking at the world differently. And I and I talk about this in, in the book with Raider, where I, I talk about being in the cereal aisle, for example. I'm just looking for something to eat. He's looking at, oh, which boxes will have the B and the T and the K that I can use for my messages to the police? Or he's in the post office and he's looking at the, the wall of stamps and he's, want, oh, I want the one with the train because I think about tying little girls to the railroad track and having trains run over them. So I like, I don't pick stamps with that in mind, right? right. So I'm, most of us don't, but for him, he's looking at the world in a predatory way. And the predator is, oh, is much more vigilant and ready uh, for putting his plan into place than most of us are thinking about the world. We just go about doing our business. We fall into habits. We don't really look around or do, you know, worry about stuff. But the predator is always very vigilant. Um, and now there, he also had an interesting concept um, that we in psychology call compartmentalization, but he called cubing. And that is the idea that the cube has multiple sides. So he could be a good father, uh, a serial killer, a good husband, a liar, a churchgoer, you know, all these different sides of the cube. And he could just flip the side up to, to whoever, you know, he was with to be, to play that role, that life frame, as he called it, which I think is a much better concept than compartmentalizing um, because, because it's all together in one person and he can just, he's not emotionally rooted in integrity at all. So he can just flip and be whatever he needs to be for any given situation. He can help his daughter with her homework or take her on a hike. He can, um, you know, advise his son about a girlfriend or and be the good father, the good husband, the provider, the good employee, the good churchgoer, etc. And also be the predatory serial killer on the lookout for the next project. Yeah, it's a, that, that boggles my mind, too, that the family really never had a clue that he was like this. I mean, because when you go back to look at Ted Bundy and, and the one girlfriend was afraid of him because during sex, he, he had he had really gotten like in like into a trance and started strangling her. So it makes me wonder if anything like that happened. In yeah, his but she mostly wasn't. Yeah, but she, she most of the time she wasn't afraid of him. Those were just a few instances she thought were odd. Um, mm -hmm. But only in retrospect, after he, she realized he's a serial killer, did she think she was genuinely in danger? Um, because you'd have to question, well, why would you keep going back or why would you let him stay with you? You'd have to question if she really thought he might kill her. But she didn't. And, and even uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's father, for example, wrote a great book about um, how easy it was to look the other way, to not believe his son was doing anything abnormal, um, to believe Jeffrey's excuses. And that one time he actually was holding the box with a head in it. And he and his Jeff said, would you, you know, I'll show it to you tomorrow. It's got pornography in it. I just don't want you to open it. So the father, I mean, he should have opened it, right? Yes. But who, who in any family is thinking, oh, that that's a serial killer there. My husband or my son or my daughter, that's a serial. They, we don't do that. We generally think the most benign explanation, even for very aberrant behavior. We hope it's a phase. We hope it can be medicated. We hope that, you know that they're not out there actually raping or killing somebody. Um, but most of us are not thinking automatically, oh, that behavior, that you lied, you're a serial killer. We don't think like that. No, I and guess we don't. Because it's a pretty bad relationship. 
because you look at even even the story of, of Ed Kemper. I mean, he would have the bodies in the trunk of his car, he and he'd be over to having dinner with his grandparents, like it, with his grandparents. like it was a nothing. Not his grandparents. He killed them when he was fifteen. Sure he killed them, but he'd be. A, I think it was the grandmother. One of them was in the trunk, and he was having dinner with somebody. No. No, no, he, no, no, he killed his grandparents when he was 15. So that's okay, the first okay. time he killed. Okay. So then one of his yeah. after he got out of, so one of his yeah. yeah. And there was yeah. one time where he went to his mother's house and he had, a, trunk, he had a body in the trunk of the car because he, because it was a, um, trying to get back at his mother. He was, he wanted to, he brought the body into the house while his mother was sleeping. Um, and, and he buried a head in the yard. So that was just because he was angry at her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was something like that. I just couldn't remember. I, mean, I read it a long, 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 long time ago when I was a teenager. So yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he he first got in trouble by killing his grandparents and right, going right. to juvenile. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, it's just when when you, when you look at these cases and you look at these guys and they're. And like you say, and, and there's there's so many of them. It's not just the ones that make the headlines. You know, there's so many out there. You know, um, it's just it's just amazing that that they, they can live among us and we don't realize it. Well, they're not killers twenty four seven. They 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 generally have quite a few have families. Most of them have jobs of some some type. Um, yeah, they they are among us, but we're it's probably not the numbers that we've heard quoted because I know that uh, one of the FBI profilers made up numbers to try to get Congress to fund their their bicap computer and whatnot. So it's probably not as as uh, many as some people think, and we've heard quoted. But but yeah, I mean they're out there for sure, and you have to be careful. I just did a lecture today on healthcare serial killers. The people with the nurses and doctors and oh yeah, you know, the ones in the hospital have our care, yeah. and we had we had one here in our in our own uh, backyard, basically Charles Cullen, and he murdered at, at least twenty nine is how many he copped to and and attempted to kill six more. Most of the the coroners here think it was much higher numbers, um, but he he went from one institution to another, sixteen in. Um, or 10 different institutions in 16 years and killed a lot of people or put them at risk. Absolutely. Question in the chat room is what is the difference between a serial killer and a mob member? I think she means a, hit, a, a, a mob killer. Well, a mob killer can be a serial killer. You know, if ser people think that serial killer is a type of offender and it's not, it's a description of a behavior. They've murdered at least twice so two different occasions it's easy to qualify as a serial killer very easy so if you're if you're a mob hitman and you've killed at least twice you qualify but generally we're thinking more along the lines of soldiers in organized crime are not the same as predatory serial killers um they have they're obeying orders or you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing as part of the organized structure of, of the crime family versus people who are out there, you know, killing people because for something they want, for mm -hmm. greed or power or sex or something like that. So just different motivations. But, you know, if you just look at the FBI's uh, definition, they all qualify. Interesting. Now, you don't have to mention any names or anything like that, but is there anybody that you have interviewed in your career that has actually scared you? Hmm. No. Okay. <laughs> that might say something more about me than anything. Right. Not really, because I think I do a lot of prep before I talk to people. I'm I'm not someone who's sort of collecting all the serial killers I can collect. Nothing like that. Um, so when I be, when I do that much work before I approach them, um, I usually have a pretty good sense of them. I have to work 
uh, to get them to trust me. Mm -hmm. So by that time, I don't know, the, the fear factor would be pretty low. So I know. Now, have any of them done things that really gross me out? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Some of them have, for sure. I think they and, do and it. Kemper is a good example. Yeah. I think they do it for, like, if you're going to interview right. them and stuff, it's a shock value thing because they want to see how you're going to react. Some do, but I don't necessarily do, you know, spend much time with them because who cares? <laughs> it's one thing to let serial killers blather on about themselves for no good reason. I, I don't do that. I don't care about that. I want to talk to the ones who want to genuinely explore, uh, think about what they've done, and then deliver something that will benefit psychology, criminal justice, and law enforcement. If they're not willing to do that and they just want to blather on about their crimes, I'm not interested in them, frankly. We have enough accounts like that. They don't really lead to anything. If But the ones that really do want to think about who they were, how they became this way, um, in a way that could be helpful to us, uh, I'm, I'm willing to talk with them. Um, Dennis Rader's case, let's see him talking to you. Was he aware? I mean, is he aware that that that, that whatever you write, you know, whatever this book is, it will help law enforcement. You know, if somebody else, you know, has has similar crimes or whatever. Uh, well, the yes, the answer to that is yes. But let me just put the frame out there. I had to be approved by the victims' families. They also get a, a big share of the proceeds of the book. I had to I had to write a proposal that they want that stated that that this is how I want I see the case there is a way to use it because he is an outlier from many of our expectations and formulas and I want to find out more about that to benefit professionals including law enforcement so they appreciated that and there were other people who approached them to do this and they turned them away because they were more into tabloid stuff, whereas I was trying to do this from a professional point of view. Mm -hmm. So um, once they approved me, then the approach to Dennis was through the, the other woman who had started all this, she introduced us. And then he had to get used to the change because that was not what he had signed up for. But he did like the idea that he might be helping. Mm -hmm. um, and he continued to, we just, we just finished, um, a four-part A&E documentary based on the book. And he did more interviews with me for specifically for that. And he does talk about, um, yeah, I, this is this is what he wants to do. He wants to be helpful. Now, obviously, that could be manipulative. It could be self-serving in some way. Um, but it, it genuinely does help. So I'm I'm happy to work with someone like that. Question in the chat room is: Have you interviewed Charles Manson? Chat room is: Have you interviewed Charles Manson? I have not interviewed Charles Manson. He was a person who was highly manipulative. Uh, did most of his interviews for um, effect. Uh, he he liked to do impression management. He liked to scare people. He he de made many demands on people who came in to interview him. We have no idea how much of his story is true or not, because um, he he let, he just made stuff up sometimes. And there were people who were able to befriend him and and get some good material from him. You know, more power to them. I I wouldn't have had any interest in interviewing him for a number of reasons, but one of them being that he was just a showman. He just he wanted to exert his domination over people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find that particularly interesting. The other one that I, I don't think I would want to interview is Eileen Munoz. I don't think I would want to interview is Eileen There's just something about. Oh, I would have. I would have. There's just something about. You know. Well, she she was manipulative also, but on the other hand, she had a horrific background story. Uh, very few people really gave her a chance to just talk about that. Uh, she was always on stage. She was always kind of the big bad female serial killer. And she played it, played that up, certainly. But I think um, she she really didn't have somebody who was trying to 
use her story to help us learn about her development. Um, but yeah, she's brash, she's loud, she was um, angry, no doubt about that. She could have been a very difficult subject. Mm -hmm. But again, I know somebody who did work with her and got some very, a good, very good book out of it. Um, I, and I do. We have this little. We have this little. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, we have this. There's a community of people who do what I do. Who really uh, go in for the long run. They're not. They're not just sort of a hit and miss. And I'm going to interview this person, then this person, then this person. They're in it for the long run. Uh, so that could take years, it, five years for Raider, for me, that was a lot. I've had some others that lasted even longer than that. Uh, and there's a few of us who are doing projects like this. We know of each other. We share information. Um, we talk about the difficulties of it, the, the stress that people get under. Um, one guy was so you know, he had trouble sleeping after he would talk to the, the person, you know, the killer. He, but he didn't put on any, any um, boundaries. He just let the guy call him day or night, run up his phone bill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, personally, I think he put on the boundaries for a reason. And, you know, but those are things we, we'd share tips, you know, maybe think about doing it this way, or how about taking a break? If you're so stressed out, you're not sleeping. How about take a break from this? Um, we'd share. I, I've learned a lot from some of these people about what's the best approach. And I and I have a whole list when I give uh, I give talks on talking to serial killers, and I give tips on here's you know if you plan to do this, here are the things that we've learned going into this and coming out of it, and and so that's you know what I try to do. That was going to be one of my questions was, you know, how are you able to, to turn that switch off after you've talked to these people? Because I know, you know, if, if they're that open to you, there's details that, that a lot of people shouldn't get, you know what I mean? And it's hard. And I remember covering a couple of cases and, then, and having to go home after court and, and have to, you know, get that all off of me. Um. I, I think it depends on who I'm talking to and what they're saying. Uh, for me, it's less the go, you know, the gory stuff. It's more when they really get, when they're really thinking hard about it and it's, it's difficult, they're working at it. Um, I then have trouble turning it off because I'm so intrigued. I'm so interested to see where this is going to go, but you know, prison calls are limited. <laughs> so, so then may I have to wait till they call again, if they call again, um, because maybe they don't want to be dragged through this, this psychological, you know, thinking that hard about their crimes, but they do call again and, and we go at it again. So that's the part for me that's hard to turn off is because I, I'm, you're in a process and then it shuts down because that's as far as that's as much as you can do on a prison call. My next question. Um, do you think uh, Dennis Rader confessed to all of his crimes or do you still think there's some out there that are unsolved? Um, personally, I think there, there could be one at least. There are some, there's some hints that there might be one more, but, um, you know, well, I'm not going to get that out of him. So <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, it's like with Ted Bundy too. I mean, they don't really know the full number of how many he killed either. You know, I don't think a lot of these guys, they're not going to know, you know, there's just, there's just too many. Well, I, you know, we don't know with Bundy because they're not all corroborated that even he said, we, we don't know for sure even the number he gave us, it's that many or it's more. You you hear all kinds of stories. Some people think it's a hundred more. Some people think it's six more than he said. We don't know. He, he might or might not know, have known. Um, and, and we do find that quite often they do not talk about early kills because they've made mistakes. 
or there are reasons why they want to keep it. You know, so we do know that there's a lot of suspicion that Bundy had killed a child when he was a teenager. Maybe he did. He wouldn't cop to it. Why wouldn't he cop to it? Well, maybe because child killers don't do well in prison mm -hmm. um, or he was embarrassed or, you know, whatever. He wouldn't cop to Kimberly Leach when when they were questioning him in his final interview. And she was 12 years old. So we don't know what he withheld. And but we do find with many of these killers who confess, they they often will leave out the, the earliest one or two because they're not proud of that. They, they didn't do a good job. They made mistakes. Um, and Raider, for example, you know, he made a lot of mistakes and admits to it. But certainly like he did not expect to have the you know four people in the otero family all home that day but once he got started he had to kill them all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of like when bundy went through the um the frat house you know the girl's frat house i mean once he started right. he had to go room to room to room to room to do it Well, he was, if, if you mean the final murders, the Chi Omega murders, he was pretty much out of control by that time. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some, there's some sense that he was angry um, because somebody had turned him down and called him an old man. He was at a dance or a bar or something. And, and she sort of dismissed him like, what, who are you? Uh, and that he was angry. And I mean, that was a, that was very uncharacteristic behavior for him because not only did he go into the sorority house into different rooms which is really not his, his style but he then went down the street uh, and and went into another woman's home as well and with the final victim kimberly leach he he's driving in the middle of the day in a stolen van and he grabs her off of a school ground uh, very in, in front of people so he his behavior was very uncharacteristic by the time he was in Florida. He was definitely uh, unraveling. Do these guys do that? I mean, they get to a certain point where, like, like with Ted Bunny, when he knew everybody was after him, you know, he was going to be caught no matter what. At that point, do they get to a certain point where? Well, they I don't think he thought that. Okay. okay. I don't think Bundy thought he was going to get caught no matter what. He was a narcissist. He, we have this thing called narcissistic immunity. We talk about this concept and the idea is that they feel special. They feel like you can't catch them. And if you do, well, you can't keep them. And if you do, well, you're not going to be able to convict them. And if you do, you won't be able to execute them. So they have this kind of thinking going on and he's, he's the poster boy for narcissistic immunity. I don't think he thought he was going to get caught. I, did, I don't think so. Okay. So, but but nevertheless, he was in a situation where um, he wasn't he wasn't uh, able to support himself. He and he had this weird sock addiction. That was another weird weird thing that was going on with him. Uh, but he, he was he was having a hard time. Similar to when he made his first escape, he got out in the wilderness and he could not make it. He had to turn himself back in or die because he was not prepared. Once he was in Florida, now he did go to Michigan first and it was in the middle of winter and too cold for him. So he, he left that place and went to a warmer climate. But even so, he didn't have a job. He had to steal. He knew he was taking a, he, a lot of risk in his behavior. So I think he was, was having trouble, but I don't think he thought he was going to get caught. I don't think so. He's an interesting case to follow because, you know, like, 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 like they call him, you know, that deliver a stranger thing because he was nice looking, you know, and, 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 the, and the girls would, would, would go with him. I mean, I don't know if I would do that if I was at a park, even when I was like 18, 19, if some guy approached me, you know, with his arm in a sling and said, hey, I've got a, I've got a sailboat I'd like you to help me with. Can you come over and do it? I, I, don't, I don't know if I would do that. He might have done it in the 1970s when we didn't know anything. I mean, it was, it, they're out in a resort area. It's the middle of the day. Lots of people are around. Why would they be scared? And there were women who wouldn't go as soon as they found out he wanted them to get in the car and help him get 
the boat from his parents' house, they didn't do it, which is why we had witness reports. Mm -hmm. But the two that went ended up dead. Wow. Um, you've probably seen the different documentaries on these guys. How accurate, like like the stuff that, that comes out on Bundy, how accurate is it? Um, I think the one, you know, it depends. It depends what the editor wants to do, what, what the producer wants to do. I, I was, um, I mean, I did my own, obviously, and, and they cut and, and show what they want to show, that they have their idea and I have mine. So I know when people tell me, oh, they saw the BTK documentary, I say, read the book because it's <laughs> that's where you're going to get a lot of the story, not necessarily in a, in a documentary. But I remember one of the ones, the Bundy tapes. Um, I have listened to the Bundy tapes, and I thought they cut those in a way to make him sound much more articulate than he, than he really was. Because he, he would talk and then not finish his sentences and then move on and in a real fitful way quite often. And, and uh, especially if he felt on the spot, he... he uh, so I thought that they must have edited those tapes to make him sound much more in control than I had heard him on the raw version of those tapes. Um, so that to me is about Hollywood wanting to, to, to use this as clickbait, as chickbait, as audience bait. They want people to fall in love with this guy and think he's the most amazing person. But even Anne Rule who worked with him and knew him pretty well said he he wasn't as clever, good looking, smart uh, as he liked to think he was. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really about the the media, how they portrayed him. Because, like for example, they think because he went to law school, he must be so intelligent. But he admitted he hardly went to any class, and when he did, it was over his head. He couldn't understand any of it. So, so it's not as if being a law student made it showed him to be intelligent yeah and even when he defended himself when he when he studied in the law library so that he could run his own defense he didn't do a very good job he made a lot of mistakes now the judge said to him well you know i i had you, you could have been somebody you could have you had a lot of promise there you you ran a good defense but he didn't run a good defense he's executed he did not run a good defense <laughs> Question in the chat room. Did you get a chance to interview uh, Dennis Rader's wife? And what was your impression of her? I The whole book was an autobiography. Okay. And it was not about the victims. It was not about his relatives. Uh, nothing like that. And I have said to him and to them, I will not talk about anything that I know about them. Okay. Fair enough. So I, won't, I won't say anything more. But, but they're... they're point of view is not represented because it is an autobiography. It's his story. And even the victim's family members the, the, who survived, who wanted their story in the book, I said, it's, this is not the place. Do your own book. Um, I, this is not the place for your story. Mm -hmm. So no, it was his point of view. And that was who I was working with. You know, going back to uh, the media with Bundy, I think a lot of it was, was that what Hollywood is trying to show with Ted Bundy is that here's a good looking guy. Here's a really intelligent guy and he's out doing this stuff and he can charm it. You know, he can charm anybody. And I think, I think that's the image they try to push with. Yeah, but, he, but he wasn't, he, but he didn't get his victims by charm. He often um, would pretend to be a law enforcement officer or he grabbed them and forced them into his car. I mean, there were times when he played, used the ruse of the, the arm or needing help or something. Um, but that's not charming. That's right. about, I need help. And he got that from a psychology experiment that he studied because he was a psych major. Mm -hmm. But the charm part wasn't necessarily there. And he actually was a fairly insecure guy. He didn't have the kind of confidence we saw in court or in some of the the interviews, uh, as a person, he didn't. And there were people, there's a great book written by uh, Dr. Al Carlisle, who was the prison psychologist in Utah, who did an extensive report on him uh, before they even knew he was a serial killer. And he talked to a lot of people who knew Bundy. 
And they, some of them said, this guy is squirrely. This guy is duplicitous. Uh, he's a thief. He's a liar. He's a manipulator. There were people who saw through him and did not think he was charming. But certainly there will always be the girls who think, you know, Bundy's, wow. <laughs> oh, look at it. They had Mark Harmon. They get those letters all the time. But, I mean, you know. sorry. Sorry. I mean, they let Mark Harmon play him. I just got a letter today from I just got a letter today from a woman who fell in love with Ed Kemper as soon as she saw him and thought he was perfect and and wanted wished that she had been a hitchhiker and and would have been in his car and he would have hit on her and like where, where do you get these fantasies? Why why do you want to be beheaded and raped and your corpse dumped you know down a ravine? Why, why do you want that? That's a whole nother book. You know that women who fall in love with murderers. It's a whole, and not for me. Someone else could do that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't understand that. When, you know, women who have a fascination with those guys, like the night stalker. Okay. I'm going to marry the night stalker. Well, it, it's not just a fascination. It's not just a fascination. I mean, I've seen where one woman had Ted Bundy's bite mark tattooed on her hip. Um, you know, begging to have been his victim, be, being so sorry he's executed because she wanted to have been a victim. I mean, that's not just fascination with a serial killer. There's something wrong with that. No, he needs to be on medication. <laughs> that's a medication issue. That's scary stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I know, and I have a real good friend. Yeah. And I love her to death, but you know, I, I know people. I know people that that that, that have that. I am actually writing a novel about about that stuff um, right now, so that will that will come out. But it is about people who do that. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Who do you think um, is the most uh, prolific serial killer of recent times in the United States or the world? In the in the United States. Well, we know who it is. It's Sam Little. Sam Little confessed to ninety three murders. Um, and the way, and he was very smart about doing it. He realized the kinds of victims law enforcement would not spend much resources on. They'd, they'd be under the radar, which were uh, black, drug addicted uh, sex workers. Mm -hmm. And that's, those are the kind of women he picked and killed and uh, got away with it for, num for decades. And then admitted that it was, we, don't, and we haven't corroborated Mm -hmm. uh, more than about half of what he claimed, and now he's he's died, so we won't be able to get more. But um, he said ninety three, so he would he would have the United States record for sure. Wow, wow, wow! Um, wow. In all the years that, that you've been doing this, in all the years that, that you've been doing this, who do you think is the? I don't think it might be Raider, but who is the? Uh, who is the that, that, that you've gotten the closest to? I, I won't say. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fair. Yeah. No, that's no, fair. Not going there. <laughs> it isn't Raider. Okay. Okay. No, that's fine. I No, I understand completely. It, it, it's all good. I understand completely. It's all good. What do you have to say to people who sometimes say... Sometimes when I talk to them... Sometimes when I talk to them, I agree not to talk about... Okay. ...that I'm talking to them. Okay. That's fair. That's all fair. What do you have to say to people who might think that they're involved with with a serial killer? They're what? You know that whatever you think I, like. I didn't get the question. What Bunny had girlfriends, you know, and all that, and they kind of, and the people, some people around Bunny were kind of suspicious of of his personality and stuff. What do you say to people that might be around someone that they think might have tendency like that? Oh, I don't have a general piece of advice. I would have to know a lot more about about what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, because sometimes people are just paranoid and there's nothing to it. You know, um, I, I'd have to know a lot more about about their con their the situation and why they're concerned. Okay. 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 I want to thank you for coming on this this hour went so fast. I was so fascinated by what you had to say. I was so fascinated by what you had to say. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.
Thank you so much. And hopefully we can get you on again sometime, you know, later on down the line to, to talk about some other stuff, you know, what, 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 what's next for you? I'm writing a series of novels from a point of view of a forensic psychologist who runs a PI agency and she takes on cases that are hard nuts to crack. So um, I'm having a lot of fun with that. That's next. Terrific, terrific. And, how can people and also I'm an executive producer on a show. Uh -huh. I'm an executive producer on a show called Murder House Flip. Uh -huh. And I love that. I'm, I think that's been so much fun. We're in the second season now and uh, it's about houses where murders have taken place and we bring in designers to heal the house and let the people live there more peaceably. And I love that show. It, it, it's a blast. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's on, uh, it was on a, a streaming service called Quibi, okay. which was trying to come out during the pandemic and then went down and now, and Roku bought all their content so it's a Roku original. If you have a Roku device, you can see it for free. Oh, cool. You know what I'm going to be watching tonight? I'm going to go check it out. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you. And, oh, and, and how do people get a hold of you? Or right, how can they reach you? Um, I'm, I, I've got three different Facebook pages, so it's pretty easy to find me on Facebook. And I'm, I'm now rebuilding my website, so you can't get me through there. But Facebook is probably the best place. Okay, fair enough. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. And I know some of my questions were you know, kind, of, kind of out there, but I really appreciate you being so patient with me and stuff. And <laughs> it's a fascinating topic for me because, like I said, you know, as, as a crime beat reporter, I, I was like face first in, in, a, in a lot of murders and stuff. And so it's just fascinating to talk to somebody, you know, like you who, who really, really, you know, get, can get in the head of these guys and stuff. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate right, it. Man. You have a good evening. Okay. That was interesting. Some of my facts were jumbled. It's been a long time since I've read up on these guys, you know? I used to have these big, thick books about these different serial killers, including Ed Gein, who, if you know about the Silence of the Lambs, that's what Buffalo Bill was based on, where he would, he would wear suits of, of women's skin. Spooky stuff. Spooky, spooky, spooky. Anyway, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. We went an hour early. My dog was even confused. I put I put her in her in her crate tonight, and she kept barking when I was trying to do uh, film the intro for this. She kept barking because she didn't understand why she was in the crate so early. So, but anyway, um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Tomorrow, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this gentleman. Terry Loveless is going to be with us. He is. On two two things here. We should be on one. There we go. Wrong button. Um, he has been abducted several several times. He's he's a very famous UFO abductee, so he's going to be with us tomorrow to talk about stuff. So he's really excited. He sent me profiles and all this. It's great. It's been great talking with him. So I'm really excited to talk with him. So tomorrow we'll be back at the usual time at 6:30 p.m. Pacific. All right. But uh, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I want to thank all our new subscribers on YouTube. I want to thank all the folks out there in podcast land who have been downloading the this, this show. My gosh, you guys, it's been fantastic. In fact, I'm going to actually spew a number because I've been kind of holding back, you know, because I'm, su I'm superstitious. And let me put it this way. Um, and see, we're in, we're in April. Yeah, in February, we have... We were at a number, and I'm always happy to get like three or four over, you know, maybe 10 over from where we were the month before, and it makes me happy. We doubled it in February. We doubled our numbers, and we're looking to triple our numbers this month. We're already past, we're, you know, we're already well past the, the download numbers we got in February. And we're on our way to a triple. So I'm real excited about that because word is getting out about this show. All right, you guys are doing your job, but you got to keep going. You got to keep sharing it. Everybody that's listening, everybody at YouTube, everybody, everybody out there around the world in podcast land, you got to keep, you know, you got you to keep sharing us. So as my sister likes to say, if you like the show, share it with five people. If you hated the show, share it with five people anyway, even your enemies, because we want to get the word out. If you're watching from YouTube and you, you happen to watch the show tonight from YouTube and you haven't done that before, please hit that subscribe button because you know we're running six days a week here six days 
no, five days a week here, soon to go six. But we're running five days a week here, and we've got shows on different topics, all kinds of topics. Tonight's one of those examples, you know, where, where, where we veer off into, into things like serial murders or, or abuse or, or other stuff, like people that eat bugs for fun, you know, things like that. We do all kinds of topics, not just paranormal. So please subscribe. There's that little guy down in the bottom right-hand corner with the magnifying glass and the uh, Sherlock Holmes hat. He's the one you got to click on. There's 245 videos over at YouTube, and that'll get you, you know, that, that'll take care of that. Sometimes it's hard to find us. You got to Google California Haunts on YouTube. Sometimes we come up, sometimes we don't. But uh, sometimes all you have to do is type in the, the uh, title of the video will pop right up. But sometimes it's hard. I'm behind. I've, you know, I've been I've been sick with the tooth. I've been I'm be way behind on the website. I got to get that caught up. But if you want an easier way to get to the YouTube site, go to CaliforniaHauntsRadio.com and click on whatever video happens to be on the front page. That'll take you to YouTube, and you can check out all the videos we've done. You know, coming up, we're going to have some how-to videos: how to operate certain pieces of paranormal equipment. So I'm going to be doing that. In fact, my studio is ready to go with that. I was just waiting to get this tooth thing out of the way so I could be in front of a camera without looking like one of the chipmunks, right? So anyway, so yeah, we're going to be doing that. So we're going to offer a lot of stuff. There's going to be some how-to videos on there, some reviews on equipment. We're going to be doing a lot of a lot more different things that we're going to add to that. Ghost tours, ghost another ghost tour I'm, I'm starting to put together. Training. I'm going to be putting together a paranormal one, a paranormal, uh, paranormal investigating 101 sh training. We're going to be doing that. I'm going to have a psychic development class next weekend. See if we can get people for that. Check out the California Haunts Meetup for the information on that. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff coming up. And I hope you stick with us because we want to take you along for the ride. Okay? Anyhow, you see that wonderful thing flashing along the bottom? That's because California Haunts takes no money for any investigations or anything like that. We don't. We're out to educate people and help people. That's our goal. So everything you see here, whether it's the mic, my fancy little hat. I got a clock over here telling me what time it is all the time, how long we've been on the air. Lights, cameras, computers, paranormal equipment. I pay for it all. It all comes out of my pocket. Internet service, blah, 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 blah. Just like utilities connected with the show. All comes out of my pocket. So I can use a little help because this is all I do. I'm retired. This is all I do. If you could help me out, keep the show on the air, keep things going, that would be great. Jen down there, my headphones died. Boom. I got a nice donation from Jen. Got new headphones. That's the kind of thing I need help with. You know, it's just it's one of those things. Anyway, I really appreciate it. So besides subscribing to YouTube, if you could help me out a little bit, that'd be great. That's paypal.me at California Haunts. If you're uncomfortable with PayPal, Venmo. Go to Venmo, type in California Haunts, and you're there. But I would really appreciate it. And any help you can give me to pay the bills here, I appreciate it. Because I love doing this show and I want to keep it on the air. All right. That being said, again, thank you guys for coming tonight. Let me get on the right page here. Click my little buttons. Soon we'll have a producer working behind me. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight, and I will see you tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Pacific for Terry Loveless. Have a good evening.